and potentially do multi-factor bypass. So we've definitely seen things in the financial world where criminals will inject code into a web page. User inserts their token, but they don't really insert their token to the bank or the application. They inject that or send it to the criminal. The criminal takes that and then puts it into a, a session, and then they're able to you know, conduct transactions without having the actual token by injecting uh, dynamic code. So this is one way you could potentially also bypass multi-factor authentication. The other thing is you can grab session IDs. So you can grab J session IDs or uh, other, other uh, tokens that may be interesting to you off the wire. So that's kind of what we're going for. Uh, just to level set, um, where, we've, where I'm putting this code, I've numbered different functions here. So as we go through the code, you can see one, two, three, four, this is where that function's operating. Essentially, we're going to drive client traffic through our PowerShell script. Uh, we're going to tamper with that, and then we're going to return the request uh, back to the client. All right, if you look at the code that's on GitHub, uh, if you break it down, there's basically five main functions. So, uh, you know, kind of, well, as I take you through this PowerShell script, I wanted you to get a feel for it. It's, it's, uh, each of these scripts or each of these functions stands alone. So feel free to take it and use it in, in other parts of your code or what you, whatever project you may be working on. But effectively, if we walk through the sequence, there's a main function, essentially sets up some listening ports. Those are configurable on the box. We're going to receive the client request and respond to the client, steps one and four in the previous slide. We're going to forward the uh, request to the server in step two. We're going to get the response back in step three. And then all the while, we're going to use this function that I wrote called invoke create certificate to on the fly create the certificates dynamically for the uh, application. Okay. How many of you use makecert.exe? Okay, so um, I kind of put a joke in here that I, you know, the tool is not intuitive. It's not native either. So if you're going to if you're going to be conducting this type of operation or uh, intercepting SSL traffic, you'd have to bring make cert with you, and that's an artifact I don't want to leave on the machine. So th the goal here was how can I do certificate generation without make cert? So this does it by using a a DLL that's native to Windows called cert enroll DLL. We're going to misuse that uh, DLL essentially to create dynamic certificate authorities, install those into the trusted certificate root, and then uh, put those, uh, you know, dynamically create those uh, requested domains. So all of this is mainly using cert enroll.dll. We can do a functionally equivalent to what make cert will do for us without leaving files on the system. So let's take a look at this code. Essentially, the, the uh, function invoke create certificate is going to have two parameters. We're going to take a subject line for the certificate, and we're going to have a Boolean value that basically says, is this a certificate authority or not? Uh, that's really it. And, and uh, like I said, what this will do will create the certificate and install it for you. Let's take a look at some of this code. How many of you have used the COM interfaces before? And, and uh, you know, okay, so some of you have seen this before. So uh, this was something new I had to get used to, but uh, functionally we're going to instantiate these objects. Uh, it's well documented on MSDN, but rather hard to find uh, good examples. So hopefully this will be uh, some useful examples of how to use that API. Um, so we're going to create, for example, to start the process off of creating the certificate, we're going to create the key and we're going to use the Microsoft Enhanced Cryptographic Provider. I found that one to be useful for what I was doing for demonstrations. Essentially, it, it's going to create an RSA key, and it's going to be signed with uh, using the SHA hash, essentially. And uh, we're going to start with 1,024 bits. You can see there on line three. So we set the property of key length equal to 1,024. I tried different key links, but you'll find some browsers will throw errors, because I, re I really didn't care how secure the session was with the client, right? So I was going for low overhead, so I tried like a 512-bit, uh, and, and some of the browsers were reporting errors. So 1,024 is kind of where it settled as a good uh, medium. I didn't want to go too secure, because again, I'm, I'm just cracking that session open anyway. Um, and then I'm going to set the machine context. You can explore this. Uh, you can either install these certificates in the, in the uh, machine store or the user store. Uh, what I found is when you're administrator on the box and you install this into the machine, uh, there's no errors. Uh, so that the user doesn't get prompted, are you sure you want to install this uh, certificate? So that's what I was going for there. 
and then we create the key, call the method key create. So that's essentially setting up the, the key pairs uh, needed for this certificate. Then we're going to create the certificate object. Again, we're going to go ahead and initialize step one there, the private key using the variable we created in the previous slide. We're going to go ahead and create a subject line and an issuer. I started doing this without having an issuer, and I found that when I wanted to clean this up, <laughs> so when I want to remove these certificates, it's far easier if you have the issuer set. Uh, it is possible to completely obliterate your trusted root store. Um, just be careful. So <laughs> it made it a little easier for me. And then step four and five, these are arbitrary values, but what we're going for here is we're setting the certificate, um, the dates that the certificate is valid. So what you can run into here is if you do this too quick, you'll get certificate errors because the, the timing. So what I did is I essentially in step four there, we're backing up a day from whenever the client requested the certificate. And then we're going forward, the certificate's valid for 90 days. Uh, those are, I didn't put those in as parameters, but you can certainly customize that. It's completely arbitrary, right? You could persist that certificate on a machine for 10 years, 20 years, doesn't matter to me. Uh, but 90 days seemed to be it, all I needed for a working solution. So that's really it. Uh, you know, when you look at this code, there's not much using this particular DLL. We're able to very quickly create certificates, create the key pairs, create the certificate, and install those into the key store. What this, what this looks like then on the client machine when you're doing the local connection is if you look uh, at the top, you can see each domain that the user requests, as they, as they request that domain, I'm going to spin up a certificate for that domain. You can see on the right there at the top, it's going to be signed by my interceptor root, uh, trusted root. And you can see that it is installed uh, by default there uh, at the bottom. You'll notice little, key, little keys uh, on the certificates. When you look at this, that just indicates that the, that certificate has the private key associated with it. So uh, again, all of that's going to be done transparently. So we're able to create those certificates dynamically. All right, once we've got that, the next thing we really need to look at is I need to receive the client request. So this is where we get into the HTTP portion of this. So uh, primarily, how many of you are familiar with SSL through proxies? I mean, you guys are, I'm guessing, most, okay, some of you may be new to this, so I just wanted to level set this a little bit, but uh, you know, essentially, when the client's driving their traffic through the proxy and they want to use a secure session, they're going to call the connect method, essentially. So what I'm going to do is watch for that string. If I see a connect method, I'm going to go ahead and uh, promote, or I'm sorry, rather respond to the client. And then I'm going to promote the stream to an SSL stream, which is actually trivial to do uh, using some of the .NET uh, classes that are available to us. And then everything else, we're just going to proxy. So what I was going for here was a transparent, seamless interface for the user so they could surf, uh, you know, driving traffic through this proxy and they could do secured, unsecured sessions uh, and it, it's all transparent for them. So once, we, once we've matched on that connect request from the client, there's basically three lines of code that I use to promote my uh, uh, stream to an SSL stream. Very trivial here. So we're gonna, first of all, check the certificate store to see if the client has requested this domain or not. And if they haven't, we'll create the certificate dynamically in step two. And you can see we're calling our invoke certificate with the domain name and then false being it's not a certificate authority. Kind of hard to see on the screen there. but And then lastly, we're going to use the authenticate as server method and the parameter we're going to take in here is SSL, that we the, cert the fake certificate that we created. Uh, I'm going to go with TLS here. Uh, you can certainly use SSL version 3. That works fine, too. And uh, you, you want to be careful, and I'll touch on this later. There's some new enhancements in Windows 8.1 and IE 11 uh, that don't allow it to negotiate weaker ciphers. So I'll show you how to get around some of that in a little bit, but TLS works fine. Uh, to, to connect, have the client connect and promote that stream. That's it, right? So we're able to uh, very quickly and easily check the certificate, create it, promote the stream, and now we've got the clear text request coming in from the client. Some of you are probably 
already ahead of me on this, but this is very inefficient actually. Um, you know, creating dynamically, creating these key pairs uh, is expensive computationally. So what, what I'm proposing is probably uh, in a future version of this script, I'll, uh, we can pre-stage certificates, so you could pre-compute those for domains that you're interested in. And uh, this also writes to the registry. So uh, one of the things I want to add to the script is the ability to do the, you know, have certificates encoded uh, in the script. And I'm working on that right now. For, so for those of you who are uh, sort of uh, looking at digital forensics, this would be one artifact that would be left behind, would be these certificates would be stored uh, in the registry if they're not cleaned up properly. Okay, so we've created uh, certificates. We've got the client uh, connecting to us. Uh, the next thing, uh, before I get into the last two functions, a couple of side notes here. One of the things that was interesting as I was writing this was I was really interested in the text base, you know, tampering with a, an online banking session, and I had to deal with all this, you know, surprisingly binary content. Um, just kidding on that. But essentially, most of the examples you'll find on that are string-based. So most of the request and response stuff is going to be based on that. Uh, I'm going to use byte arrays, uh, which presents some interesting challenges in PowerShell. But I found the two functions that I use quite a bit in the script you'll find are system text encoding, and uh, we can either use get bytes or get string. Um, I'm open to other suggestions on that if that's not the best way to do it, but it seemed to work fine for what I was doing in this proof of concept. So the remaining functions that we're going to use are going to operate on these. We're going to pass a byte array in and return a byte array back to the client. Okay, so once the client's connected to us, we've promoted the stream. We're going to leverage the HTTP web request method to handle the proxying of this request. Probably not the best idea. As I got into this, I was attached to it, <laughs> wanted to make it work. You could certainly do some of this proxying at a socket level. I found, though, for what I was doing, trying to demonstrate this, uh, I wanted to keep these, uh, keep it at the, these classes. So HTTP web request is well documented. We're going to take the client request and we're going to map it into that object. And then we're going to start tampering. And then the one thing that's going to get you with HTTP web request is the exception handling. So for example, client makes a request to a page, it returns a 404 error. The, that object's going to uh, throw an exception, so you'll see in some of the code ways to handle those exceptions and return the response back to the client. So, Two, two examples I wanted to go over in the code are related to gzip and then changing a user agent string. Just remember, everything that the client sends you is subject to tampering at this point. These are two examples I found fairly useful. So what we're going to do, for example, is take the HTTP headers that are sent in from the client, and we're going to run them through a switch statement. Some of the uh, headers are defined in the class. For example, there is a header defined as user agent. So what we're going to do is if we match that in the request in step two, we're going to you know, basically append the word intercepted uh, to the traffic. So, you know, somebody running the script out of the, out of the box, uh, you could have some fun with that, right? So you could, uh, you know, drive somebody's traffic through this and put uh, different attack strings or different signatures and uh, test a web application firewall, for example, whatever you might be going for. So it's, it's completely arbitrary there, but we're just going to, you know, change that user agent string to intercepted. The other one that's interesting was accept encoding, and I found this to be an interesting challenge in that most of your content's obviously going to be gzip compressed. So I was working on looking at a malware sample a while back, and I saw that the authors were just stomping the gzip. <laughs> so they basically zero that out or blank that, so that essentially they don't have to unzip and uh, recompress the uh, strings to tamper with it. So that's what I'm going to do in step three. I'm going to take, if the client's requesting a gzip encoding, I'm just going to flatten that. Uh, and not request that so that it makes it easier to read the code and tamper with those requests and responses. So, so those are, you know, some things to think about there. You can tamper with uh, any of the fields or any of the parameters in the request. Step four, something to be careful of here, that method, HTTP web request, has a stream that you will need to access if you're going to write data to the, a post or a put uh, type request. So, you could certainly do that, and I'll show an example of that. I just have a, a, you know, a check there that says, hey, if this is a post, then we may want to tamper with that a, a slightly different way. So that's essentially, you know, we're using, by using the 
defined libraries. Um, that's the great thing about PowerShell is that it gives you access to those classes and we don't have to code around a lot of different uh, issues. That once the, res you know, once the request is received, we're going to send that to the server. The server is going to send us back a response. We're going to use the HTTP web response object or class and now we can tamper with that as well. We can, uh, you know, a particular interest would be the set cookie header in a response. So that's where your session IDs are going to be stored. That may be where we want to grab those tokens that we may want to use in other parts of our application and then ultimately return a byte array back to the client. So let's look at some code for that. Um, the one thing you run into with cookies, especially in that class, is it returns all the cookies into a single um, property of that object, but only will return one back to the client. So essentially what I had to do here was split those out. And this is just an example of some code that I used to use a regex. So one of the great things, PowerShell is great with strings and parsing strings. So what we're doing here uh, is we're splitting on a comma, but not a comma space, because uh, some of the cookies have a date and they have a comma space in the date. So this is, a, you know, kind of an interesting way to get at the cookie data. And you can use cookie containers, but I find it to be uh, unnecessary for what I was doing for tampering with the uh, response. So, uh, Basically, so this is a really simple example. We're going to take, I'll show you in a minute, we're gonna, anywhere I see the word cyber in a search string, I'm going to replace it with kitten, right? So the idea here is anything can be uh, replaced. So things that would be more interesting might be find the closing uh, body tag on HTML and inject the JavaScript line or something like that. So obviously you'll see this uh, in an example, very, very easy to match a string and just replace it. I'll leave it up to you to however you guys want to use the script to tamper with the different sessions. The last part of, uh, you know, handling the client response and I'd be open to some feedback on this in particular was I have, basically what I end up with is I end up with two blocks, uh, two byte arrays. I've got a header and an entity body. I've got to combine those back together and ship them back to the client. I used block copy here you can see in step three to do that. I don't think that's the most efficient way, but again, going for proof of concept, this is one way to combine the two arrays and just write those back uh, into the client string. And then step five, we're just going to return, you know, take the return value and send that back to the client. So fairly basic stuff here, combining the header and entity bytes. So what other things you, can you do? Uh, you know, obviously we talked about how I can take a string, find and replace. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Beef framework? So this is, this is an amazing tool and uh, I found this is one way to inject Beef into a session. Uh, so it's great, so you, you host the JavaScript snippet uh, somewhere you just uh, you know find and replace and add that to interesting domains. So hopefully you'll use this. This is one creative way to use this PowerShell script is to in get beef uh, injected into the browser. All right, let's look at a couple of demos. All right, so before I set this one up here, what you can see in the background here is um, essentially. Uh, just writing the output to uh, the console, which I know write host is, is not a good idea, but for this particular uh, proof of concept, it worked okay. You can do whatever, you, you know, really the advantage of using uh, the PowerShell and, and .NET classes is that you can move the objects around. So generally you don't want to just deal with the text. You can connect to a remote machine, be running this PowerShell script. Here you'll see an example of my tamper session. So the users, uh, I used Bing because it's image intense, and you can see that the PowerShell script works fine handling those uh, images. So here the user is going to go out, perform a search. And we'll replace all the strings we see. So this is great, right? So. Um, The, the kitten thread is huge. Just want to make sure we're clear on that. Uh, but, you know, very, very simple example, but uh, let's get a little bit more uh, devious. Uh, the way criminals will do this is they will inject, here's an example of my checking account, so I had $32 in my account. 
But thanks to my PowerShell script, I have a balance of a million dollars, right? Now, I didn't change anything on the banking side, right? I didn't change the database or anything like that. All I did was change what was presented to the user. So you, you get an idea of the way that this script is, you know, could be used to demonstrate nefarious purposes, right? Um, an attacker changes or makes a transfer and then continues to persist the balance that the person thinks is in their account. So the only way they would ever know that fraudulent transactions may have occurred on their account is when they actually check their statement because everything's been presented in the UI to them uh, all along thinking they had that right balance. So, th so that's one thing you can do. Uh, again, I, I wanted to use the script to demonstrate these type of things to uh, members of our organization and sort of the power of uh, what this type of script's capable of. Next one. So what you're looking at here is a use of the script where at the top of the script we have the user in their Gmail account. And the user sends a message to their Outlook friend that says attack at dawn. But because we were driving that through the PowerShell script, the recipient receives attack at noon. Right, so again, you get the idea of by by tampering with these sessions, I can not only change what the user receives, but I could also change what is sent. Uh, so again, I'll leave it up to you guys to feel how to, you know feel free to uh, expand the script. I look forward to seeing interesting things you can do with this. So, so let's get into a little bit on the the script usage. So I basically have five parameters on this particular script. Uh, the first one is going to be the listen port. So I, by default, the proxy server listens on port 8081. Completely configurable. As you get into the code, essentially there's um, a line in there that sets up a firewall rule to automatically allow that port uh, to listen. So you don't have to change it. You know, that, what that does is suppresses the prompt when a user tries to start up something listening on a port. It'll prompt them, are you sure you want to listen? By going ahead and preemptively creating that firewall rule, uh, we can suppress that message. The next two parameters that you would use would be proxy server and proxy port. So most of you in your pen testing or testing environments will be in a corporate environment with an upstream proxy. This is another reason why it was easier to use some of the .NET methods that were available to me. So there's a lot of ways to you know, input a proxy string so I just try to keep it simple here. So there's, you put in the proxy server or the IP address of the upstream proxy, and then you just put in the port, uh, whatever you're forwarding into. So that, that allows you to chain your script transparently with other proxies that may be in the environment. Uh, there's a tamper switch you can use if you're wanting to get into uh, you know, changing the code. I'll leave it up to you to tamper those sessions. And then lastly, uh, hosting the CA. So the challenge that you'll find is when you start intercepting the SSL traffic is you have to get your certificate onto that remote device. So what I did here is I created a simple um, listening port to host the certificate to allow me to uh, install that on, say, a mobile phone or a remote device. So that one, I'll just give you an example, and we'll take you through the code on this one. So again. The point here is when you're driving this script locally, everything works fine. It installs the certificate into the necessary stores. Uh, we're going to use a, a feature of a PowerShell called a job. So um, this is a, basically like a thread, if you will. They're not exactly, but what we're going to do here is we're going to set up a listening port on 8082 so that we can serve up certificates to remote hosts in the meanwhile, we'll be transparently proxying or tampering with the traffic. So all you would have to do is point the remote device to port 8082, um, put in i.cer or whatever you want there, and then it will download the certificate to the mobile device. Uh, so there was some great code out there, ObscureSec. Uh, Chris wrote some good code. I basically just borrowed this <laughs> uh, and put it into a, a PowerShell job. So the thing that this does is when you're running the script, it's going to pull the certificate out of the store and write it back to the client. It doesn't actually write to the disk. Uh, again, in, in future releases, I'll be uh, avoiding you know, some of the registry stuff we're doing. But th this way, you can uh, serve up a certificate without having to write it to the disk first and then ship it out to the client. So uh, very easy code. You can see in about 10 lines of code or so here, I can create a 
HTTP listener, and then I can serve the certificate from the store back to the client. All in the background using a PowerShell job. So let's look and see what this looks like. Okay. Put this up here. So what you're looking at here, uh, so I've, you know, a little background on this. I'm basically driving um, a, a remote device, a, a, you know, my Mac through a PC. We're going to connect to that, download the certificate onto the device, and then transparently proxy the traffic. So the client's going to make a request to the certificate. That's going to drop here. I had already sort of installed that just so for the sake of time and for the demo here, you can see now on that device, we've got a trusted root certificate that we created with our PowerShell script. And now we can then proxy traffic as we go to various sites. Pause this here at the right spot. And you can see that that sets up the certificate chain. So you can see we've dynamically created the uh, google.com certificate signed by the interceptor root. So those of you familiar with uh, you know, this type of operation, if you're going to be testing mobile applications or driving remote devices, this script works well uh, for that too. So hopefully you find that useful. All right. And then a couple more examples here. Sorry. So you can see this is an example of driving an iPhone. Uh, a couple other certificates. Essentially, you point the phone at that URL, install the certificate as a profile, for example, in iOS, and then you're able to drive traffic through that proxy. All right. What are some ways you could other uses for these scripts? So. This is where hopefully this will find value for you guys. You could potentially do web application attack scripts. So again, by changing or tampering with those requests, you could drive uh, various iterations through, of, of strings or uh, tools through this script. You could use it. Uh, developers could hopefully use this for some HTTP debugging. Again, the benefit here is there's nothing to install. Uh, PowerShell is there on the device already, so I just have to invoke the script. Those of you doing malware research, um, one of the things you can do here is, uh, you know, spoof or look at command and control traffic. So you could drive, you know, put this script on a device that's infected, drive it through your proxy, and then see if the malware is proxy aware, uh, you know, mold the environment to what the malware may be expecting for C2 or uh, look at some of the different strings that are coming in there. Or again, uh, mobile application intercept. All right, so... Most of my day is spent uh, on the defensive side, so I wanted to put a, a few nods here to how do we defend against this type of attack. So how many of you are familiar with certificate pinning? Some of you have seen this. Okay, so uh, there's tools out there, for example, Trustier or even Microsoft's Emmet tool will do this. Um, it does work. I found it to be effective. I'm certainly open to discussion on that. But essentially, it will prompt the user saying, you know, you are connected to Google.com, but that certificate does not match uh, what Google should be. So very useful utility um, is certificate pinning. Some other ideas would be, again, for those of you looking for this type of activity in a, you know, on, a, on a compromised device, you could look for rogue certificates in the certificate store. So what we've, we've got here is essentially the registry keys where those trusted root certificates are stored and where they're created. Still some things to do. So again, like I, I hope you guys will take this and, and modify it, use it. Uh, I did add some certificate cleanup in there. So there's a, uh, you can now remove all of the certificates. You can just invoke the remove certificate function. Pull that out. Um, you can also add auto proxy configuration, which is one of the things I decided to leave out of the script, but there's certainly within 10 to 15 lines of code, you could dynamically change the proxy setting uh, on a browser uh, and drive that traffic through. For most of my demos, I use uh, just a, a, a plugin 
uh, that switches the proxy, but again, in a pen test environment, you'd want to add some of that, and I should add that in a, a future release. Uh, other things to do would be add interesting domains, so pre-stage certificates or add, um, you know, lists of domains that you want to capture the traffic for, pull that in. All right, so this is what I wanted to build, right, some, you know, grand masterpiece script. Uh, that was exciting, easy to use. Uh, sometimes it feels like this is what I built. Um, but I, you know, I do appreciate the feedback. Like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm presenting this as, as one tool that you can use to demonstrate man in the middle effects. And I hope you'll use it, uh, customize it. And like I said, connect with me on Twitter. Sub T used to be Infosec Smith too. Feel free to contact me if you have questions. At this point, I'd like to open it up for you guys for questions that you may have for me. Uh, and yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so the question was, when you run the script, do you need local admin? In this example, yes, you do. Uh, so this, this script requires local administrative privileges to run that, and that's primarily to install uh, into the machine store. You could, um, a couple of tweaks you could make, and you could run this as a, as a user. Uh, the one, one uh, caveat to that would be they'll be prompted when they have to install that certificate. I haven't found a good way to bypass that yet, but yes. So good point. You do require local administrative uh, rights to run the script. Question here. So it does work in two. Um, that's what I was going for was um, lowest common denominator, so it, it, it does not require anything uh, beyond that. So hopefully that uh, is helpful uh, for you guys. Absolutely. Other questions, thoughts, feedback? Yes, sir. Uh, good question. Um, I, I should have done that, right? Yeah. So I could, yeah, for for some of the, like, especially like uh, Google domains, G Static, and some of those, I could have just done a wildcard certificate. So uh, fair point. Uh, absolutely could could add that uh, to the script. So yeah. Other thoughts, questions? Yes, sir. Okay, I, actually, so uh, the question was related to uh, using different character sets in the certificate name uh, to spoof the issuing authority. So I, I did not explore that. So I would, I'd be open to looking at some of that uh, as well to, to spoof the actual issuing authority. So uh, that's, a, that's a great point, absolutely. Any other questions? Hopefully you guys find this useful. Again, it was a project that I... I, I use this because I wanted to learn some of the PowerShell, but also at the same time demonstrate uh, what's possible uh, with uh, SSL uh, interception and uh, man in the middle attack. So I'll be around uh, for any other questions, and I'm open to any of your feedback on this. So hopefully you guys will take, check out the code and, and give it a try, run it in uh, boardrooms across America, hopefully. So thank you.